now we have time for questions and answers. <clears throat> and uh, I would kindly ask you to introduce yourself before asking a question. And also, <clears throat> uh, also mention your affiliation. And probably also, to whom are you addressing your question primarily to? Um, yes, so questions, please. Yes. Thank you. Um, I work for, uh, my name is Jorge Rivera, and I work for the International Dialogue in Peace Building and State Building, which is actually hosted at the OECD, within the same team that publishes the States of Fragility Report. So I guess um, you know where my question is going. <laughs> um, so it's interesting how we define fragility, and as a Latin American, uh, you know, we're kind of um, allergic to this terminology, and I found it quite interesting to be working now on how the OECD defines and tries to rank countries or assess their you know, current fragility. And it's changed in the past two years towards a model that tries to define it as a multidimensional um, sort of issue um, covering the political, social, economic, environmental, and security dimensions. And so my question to you is, uh, in terms of ranking countries, what do you see as the, as the value added of this exercise? Um, are you familiar with the OECD model and uh, what are your views on this approach? And just in terms of um, understanding fragility as a, you know, as you can get worse, but, you know, it doesn't really disaggregate sort of whether fragility can affect all sorts of countries or whether we should just focus on those labeled fragile. So um, I guess my last question in that sense is what do you think of this marketplace for definitions of fragility and, and what do you think its, its value added towards the conversation of, of the issues in these countries is? Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is Antonio da Costa. I'm currently the Brazilian ambassador to Finland and I've been working for the Brazilian government for almost 40 years now, give or take some. Um, I have questions all over. I wouldn't know how to start. I had a bunch of perplexities. Part of it is like that, the one just said, which is, uh, uh, if we are going to address the issue of fragility in fragile states or fragile countries, uh, I wonder, my first question would be, once you do that and you rank these countries by fragility, by criteria that I'm not so sure, um, how do you measure? I'm not so sure how do you measure authority or legitimacy, at what level you measure authority and legitimacy, but then um, it's very different authority and legitimacy in the US, uh, Finland, and Canada, and I lived in Jamaica and I lived in Africa, how authority is defined in Rio de Janeiro, for once, my city, our legitimacy of authority in that case. So it's, it's a complicated concept, authority and legitimacy, but that I would like to know what's the usefulness of this. And then, again, uh, sometimes it's not the state that's fragile, it's part of the states that's fragile, regions are fragile, cities are fragile. Uh, you asked the question of the red light. Um, in Rio, I don't stop at red lights at night usually, but I wouldn't do that when I lived in New York and South Bronx either. So, you know, <laughs> it's, 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 it's more complicated than, than that. On, on peacekeeping, finally, um, but I do want to, I would like to know, understand the, the usefulness of this. On the peacekeeping, which uh, is something that I have followed more, more, more closely, um, I think part of the problem with current peacekeeping operations is previous success, to a certain extent. And uh, to, my, to my way of thinking, um, the international community actually saw the success of peacekeeping operations in certain situations very specific situations, and then moved to pursue peacekeeping operations in other situations in which two things were not there. One's um, consensus in the international community, let's say, within the UN system, that that peacekeeping operation was useful and purposeful and had a mandate, complications in getting the mandate, and as you pointed out in the Central African Republic, intervention by UN member states in regions where peacekeeping operations were being pursued that actually undermined the peacekeeping operations. So I think um, when we look at peacekeeping operations, I think we should not lose sight of this political, let's say, 
background of, of what contemporary peacekeeping operations um, uh, do. And a final comment on this. Um, uh, for some years, I, I participated on and off on our peacekeep, peacekeeping operations in Haiti. One, one thing that struck me, you're right, there are operational differences, language difference, there are a number of differences. But similar to what happens to diplomats, I think, um, one interesting thing that I found in Haiti, at least, I'm not sure you can translate that everywhere, is that military usually have a similar procedural language. They seem to think in certain categories that actually allow them to communicate more evenly than we have expected. So certain difficulties of communication, equipment, procedures, when you get to the ground, they are simpler to solve than we would expect from outside the military, let's say, institutions. Uh, but I would like Thank comments from, from all on this issue. Thank okay. You. Thank you. And here um, in front of the room. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you very much. I greatly enjoyed Graciana's uh, eight or was it nine points. And I wondered how uh, Lisa Howard in her looking at countries had seen uh, the key point, the um, just one minute, I have it here, that economic reconstruction is not development as usual. And did um, uh, Lisa and Jessica come across examples where that truth was ignored? Uh, that economic you. reconstruction was not the same as, uh, in, as business as usual? Thank you, and please. Uh, Rob Foss, um, FAO. Um, the first question is, uh, well, it was already asked before, but uh, to David on the, um, how we would use these composite indices on fragility, uh, particularly in context where um, the fragility or conflicts may be very specific to certain parts of countries. Um, so that may not say a whole lot about the capacity of the state at large. Take Colombia with its uh, civil civil war that's now ending, or Central American countries has huge gang huge gangs controlling part of the country and uh, destabilizing development uh, in specific parts of the country. So, how would one use that in such context? Uh, if you just look at um, the fragility of the state at large, which may be more specific. To um, Graciano, who was raised the issue of gender equality, inequality, and access to resources. Um, well, of course, at FEO, we pay a lot of attention to that, um, but it's also complex. It's not just giving women access to inputs to raise, but it's uh, do they have control land? Can they access credits? Um, but also, and maybe that's interesting in conflict situation, is um, what information do they have to, for instance, know whether it's better to move out of the conflict zone or to stay put where they are? And it has kind of enormous implications for food security. So what we found, for instance, with a social communication program in the um, <coughs> and, uh, DRC was that women and, and their families typically would be much better off to stay put in their areas rather than trying to move away from the conflict zone. And uh, the way we, um, we help them is just putting a social communication program where they could be uh, in contact with each other to uh, assess the situation and to see how they would, uh, um, um, how they should decide on their situation. Of course, if they abandon the land and, and the household, that makes a huge difference. So, uh, that's uh, something that um, uh, needs to be assessed uh, on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Um, then finally, and maybe that the whole panel have, has a view on that, so the FVO we're looking at uh, the nexus between not just conflict and how conflict affects, affects food security, but how food security could actually be, uh, and improve food security, be a source of peace building uh, moving forward, and then how you would act on that in uh, both in during conflict and after conflict. I have my own views on that, but I would like to hear the panel on that point. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's start with Graziana let, and move from left to right. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, first, uh, as I said, I don't like this idea of fragility where you include conflict inside the fragility definition. Uh, I think in terms of policy making, fragility outside of conflict is development as usual. I mean, they, they, can, they start from a lower base, and, but development applies there. What I'm arguing is that the, the conflict uh, the, the risk of falling back into conflict is so high that policy making in conflict countries makes it completely different from development as usual. In part because it, it uh, development, you know, there are countries at very low levels of development. So these countries have the normal development, socio-development challenges of any country at low levels of development. But in addition, they have to deal with rebuilding their economies. They have to uh, reintegrate former combatants into productive activities to ensure that they do. And this is extremely, extremely expensive proposition. So, so in addition to the normal socioeconomic uh, challenges, they have all these other challenges of peace consolidation and national recon uh, peace consolidation and national reconciliation. So uh, this is uh, my answer to to the issue of fragility. To the to the issue that you raise on peacekeeping operations, uh, you know, I, I want to. She, <laughs> she will answer you specifically, but I want to mention something that uh, um, that Liz, uh, Liz, uh, mentioned earlier, and she mentioned as an example of the of the um, CF, uh, Central African Republic. She said, "Oh, we want to have UNDP." as deputy SRSG, and this is something I'm always criticizing. Why? Because of the policy-making priorities. You know, the mandate of UNDP is a mandate for development, so they are going to focus on the human development goals, and they are focusing, they will focus, I mean, their priority in terms of budgetary allocations, whatever money they get, they will put it first to, to uh, for the development goals and for poverty and all that. And those are not the priorities I want to see in the post-conflict period. So I have a serious problem with that. I think the UN should have integrated operations, but they have to have a, somebody advising, as I was in Kosovo, advising Kushner as a special representative, but somebody who could deal with reconstruction outside the development framework of UNDP. Okay, so this is, for me, this is the key. And then I come to Rich's uh, question, and you know, the first case of that was El Salvador. But then, in, in this book that it's coming out in, uh, in February next year, I have a whole chapter with, with evidence on that. The first case was El Salvador. So what happened in El Salvador was the UN spent three years negotiating this peace process. The World Bank, it's, it's very interesting because that's when I came into the cabinet of the Secretary General at the end of December uh, 1991, before Pérez Equejar left, uh, they signal this peace agreement between the FMLN and the government of El Salvador. This was December 31st at midnight. Six days, six days later, the IMF and the government, six days later, ignoring completely the peace process, they signed a economic program for the next two years in which they didn't contemplate any budgetary allocation to the peace process. And they said, well, in uh, October, the, this was January, in October, we are going to revise to see uh, how is it going. Okay, was it, it wasn't only the fault of the IMF, it's that the, I, that, that the UN did not have economic advisors and they didn't even think of the financial implications of implementing the peace agreement. So they never sent, they never called the IMF and said, look, 
we are going to have a few financing needs to finance these peace-related projects. So what happened was that a few months later, the FMLN, there was a, a very complicated calendar where uh, the FMLN was going to do such a thing that we were going to demobilize in five trenches and the government was going to start the Arms for Land program and other programs, blah, blah, blah. But they never thought of thinking, where on earth are we going to get the resources to finance all this? So when the FMLN was going to have the second tranche demobilization, they, they decided that they are not going to do it and they were ready to go back to war. So after all this very painful process, they were ready to go back because the government could not, um, could not start the programs. Thank you. Lise? No, there we go, on. Um, uh, Graciana, I, rem I remember one of your most beautiful analogies from one of your pieces on El Salvador, where you, you likened El Salvador to a patient on an operating table with a curtain down the middle of the patient, and you had the, I am, the financial institutions on one side and the UN on the other side, both operating on the patient, but with a curtain down the middle so they couldn't see what the other one was doing. Um, it was Alvaro's idea. It's it was Alvaro <laughs> de Soto's idea. He's a brilliant man. I also. don't want to take credit oh. for it. Oh, no, really? Okay. <laughs> um, all right. I'll remember that. Um, but uh, I think part of the reason why UNDP is is working with peacekeeping directly is is for that reason, right? Because otherwise they're, they're separate surgeons. <laughs> um with not talking to, to each other and not communicating with each other. So I guess I, and especially in the Central African Republic, which is not a typical post-conflict country. It is just not. It's, it was never a war, a consolidated war. It's more a, a problem of, it, it is religious, but it's more a problem of small bands of people, these neighborhood watch groups, nomads versus set, settled agriculture, it, it's a, it's more of a fluid type of conflict with many different, many different uh, problems that can't be easily depicted in one simple view of saying Muslims versus Christians, which is the way it's often reported in the newspaper, and so, and so in that sense, it, it's not as a, it's not a a deep, enduring. Uh, violent conflict in the Central African Republic. It's much more a problem of development, which I think, I think that's why it's appropriate for UNDP to be um, a part of this picture, but maybe you'll convince me otherwise. I, I just want to say one thing about peacekeeping troops, which is um, we have this idea, I, I, they, there is a kind of a military culture, so I think that troops can communicate with one each other, one another, but it's very difficult to engage in military combat if you can't speak each other's languages. That's just one point. Another point is, and that's why peacekeepers can't do it, in Haiti they weren't engaged in combat, right? They're just patrolling and doing other things, so it's fine. <laughs> it's fine if they don't. Um, uh, my last point. There's this idea that European troops will be better at peacekeeping. And given our experience in the Central African Republic, there is, I haven't seen, and it's not just in the Central African Republics, it's in many different theaters, I don't see evidence that Europeans will be necessarily better at peacekeeping than peacekeepers from developed countries. Just my opinion, thanks. Thank you, Jessica. Great. Uh, thank you for the great com questions. I actually wanted to weigh in then on, on this one, which, it's an interesting thing because the USAID has an Office of Transition Initiatives, which is supposed to immediately do post-conflict for up to two years. And then they are supposed to transition over to the standard development side of the house. So they kind of build in a, a midway between, between this. And I don't know which of the other agencies do the same thing. Now, the problem is that DACA and OTI don't hand off to each other. They, like, internally within U.S. systems, they don't play well with each other within a relatively small organization, both headquartered in Washington. So th that's like an internal coordination dynamic with innate dynamics. Um, but so this idea of, of, of fragility, so we don't, I mean, I know those weren't directed towards me, um, 
because we purposely avoid using the, the, the fragility idea. We, um, but we, within ourselves, the three PIs on my project, um, we can't decide about whether we should be creating composite scores or not. Some of us want to, and some of us think it's it's not appropriate. Um, we wanted to do sub-regional, um, within each country analyses of authority, legitimacy, effectiveness. So we have a picture at that sub-national to the national to gain some insight into the, the regional dynamics. What I think is interesting about your example of, in Rio, right? You know that you should, you just know that security-wise you, you can't stop, right? Um, but the fact that you think that you should, to me, is really important. It's, it's, it's how people kind of internalize the state. And in some countries, so the third of the people in the audience who didn't raise their hands, they don't have a state that they've internalized, a state's authority that they've internalized, to even think that there, there's a should. There's no pause about stopping. And we think that's a really, um, important dynamic of authority versus legitimacy, and we want to be able to speak about those separately. Thank you. No, David. Okay. So I got two or three questions pretty much all related. I think when I do another presentation like this, what I'll do is begin with my results and end with the index, because typically what people do is they glom on to the deficiencies in a single rank index and neglect the results, which we're basically hoping that would, you would find compelling and would stimulate some discussion. I mean, the fragility trap is a problem. Why are we fixated on uh, single rank indices when the evidence that we derive from the use of time series single rank indices shows that there's a significant problem that's not going away? Now, with respect to the OECD, there was a time when which we were feeding into the INCAF and they were using our data as a source of information to rank countries. Uh, that stopped a few years ago and I found that the the OECD is essentially emulating our work in trying to disaggregate state fragility and claiming it to be unique and novel and new. And I've ri written a terse letter to the OECD basically just telling them that uh, far from being unique and new, uh, it is uh, essentially um, a replication of work that already exists, including our own. Um, and so I think, you know, when you have a, a major organization like the OECD just now coming to grips with the need to di diversify our understandings of fragility, I think that's problematic. It speaks to a basic unwillingness to learn about how to uh, unwrap fragility. Uh, there's uh, institutional lag between understanding the nature of the problem and responding to it. I'd say up, up to 10 years, which is how long our project has been in existence, long before uh, the Fund for Peace introduced its fragility index. Now, with respect to the utility of a single rank index, I mean, Obviously, if you don't think it has utility, then you're not the right person to be using it. Uh, you're, you're, the end user determines what is of value to them, and they pay for that service to, for you to provide a particular kind of data source in a way in which you can use that information. Uh, it does have strategic value. It does highlight countries at risk at, at a single glance. Some strategic uh, uh, decision makers find that of great value. Of course, you want to disaggregate that to determine operational relevance and how you might fit in in responding to these particular problems within a particular fragile state. Of course, a single rank index is not going to give you the nuance you need to understand sub-regional dimensions of conflict and fragility. Of course it's not. But why should methodology be the sole determinant of how we should uh, evaluate a particular project? It means you look elsewhere for your kinds of information to complement that overarching strategic assessment. That's precisely what we did uh, on behalf of the European Union, which said we're interested in subnational conflict, Kosovo, you name it, uh, regions within Eastern Europe, parts of South, South, uh, South Sub-Saharan Africa, which are technically not part of any particular country, but overlap between them, you create a new methodology for evaluating fragility. But you derive some coherence between that methodology, which is essentially dynamic or event-driven database analysis, as well as stakeholder analysis, with the uh, structural database to identify key drivers of fragility. There should be continuity between the three main sources of information that you developed. So let's not kid ourselves, single rank index isn't gonna give you a lot of information, but it's, I think, a necessary a preliminary step without which we would not be able to amass that time series analysis in order to determine whether or not there's a fragility trap out there. Uh, one year, one, one offs done once a year, limited perhaps utility for certain individuals. Uh, but you do that over 15 years, you see a significant problem that is, that is arising that is not going away, namely the fragility trap. 
you know, the World Bank so far has commented on the fragility trap, but it's just hypothetical. We now have clear evidence that such a thing, such a beast exists, and it isn't equivalent to con conflict affected states, nor is it necessarily affecting those states that are deeply mired in poverty. It's a combination of factors. Now, we, can, you know, if you want to know more about how we disaggregate that and provide nuance and detail, yeah, profile a country. Let's go to town and detail that country, but have some continuity and coherence between the overarching structural features of that country and the subnational elements that, that contribute to, to that country's fragility. Okay, uh, so with David's uh, final comments, we need to close this panel. Uh, I would invite the audience to join me in giving the final applause to our great panel. <laughs> <laughs>